you know, one of the most debilitating things that we experience sometimes, or maybe at the root of it all the time, is fear. Fear. Fear oftentimes stands at the crossroad of where we've been and where we're going. Fear oftentimes holds us so tight that we feel as though we're not capable of taking the next step of faith. And yet, at the very, very heart of the gospel, where we all start is the central affirmation that you are a child of God. Do you know what you can do with that acknowledgement? Acknowledging yourself as a child of God. The scripture teaches us all sorts of things. For instance, it says that no weapon formed against me shall stand. The scripture teaches us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And yet the one central thing that holds us back is fear. Friends, you have been released from that captivity. The seas have been parted. You can walk right on through. You are a child of God. Merciful God, we come to you today remembering remembering that you have called us from before we were even yet aware You have called us, you have created us, you have sealed us. We are your children. You are our God. So we gather in this space, O God, not just out of duty, because it's what we're supposed to do. We gather together to commune with family, to be in our home, to be here with you and with one another, and to be fed and to be nurtured and to be sustained by every word that comes from you. You sustain us in scripture. You sustain us through our baptism. You sustain us through bread and through juice. You sustain us through our friendships. You sustain us through your love. So we ask, O God, as we gather together once again, that you would speak to your children. And that we might be reminded of your great love and your great depths that you would go for us. We give you thanks for our sister, Melissa, who brings forth our scripture reading this day. May it be holy unto you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We want our lovely people online to be able to see you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, good morning, church. Good morning. This morning I'm reading Mark 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a Baptist of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
and people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem, Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river. Jordan confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with the water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Goliath and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Job, Melissa. Would you pray with me and for me? Lord, speak for your servants are listening. Oh, Lord, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all the church said, Amen. Good morning. It was a joy to have um, last week Pastor Michelle Matthews with us from Kingstown, but um, I am excited to be able to share with you all um, today as well. Today, I want to take some time to talk about what it is that we're going to be seeing here in a little while. But also to take some time to remind, to remind us, whether we've been baptized or not, to remind us who we are in Christ and what it is that God has called us to do. In an online blog that I came across not too long ago, David Lose, he's a pastor and professor. He, <clears throat> he's writing this interesting perspective on why it is that people leave the church. And this is something that's really important for us today to think about because if you look at recent studies, the, the church is declining at uh, a very rapid pace across the United States. Um, and, and the group that's growing equally fast is a group that identifies themselves as the nuns. Right? These are not the people, you know, not nuns like the women uh, groups. Uh, these are nuns, no affiliation. And, and this is not non-denominational. <laughs> this is nuns, as in I want nothing to do with that. <laughs> In fact, the nuns are growing just as fast as the church is declining. A recent Pew study suggested that for the first time in America's history, I guess you could say, there are now less than half of the population identifies themselves in any way, shape, or form as a follower of Jesus. 47% of Americans So he starts by asking the question in this article. He says, uh, he starts by, by, by saying, did you know that most of the people who leave our congregations are not leaving to go join another? Meaning they're not leaving us or somewhere else and saying, well, Actually, I want to go join over there because they have X, Y, or Z. He says that's one of the great myths circulating in recent years about church growth. That when folks leave our congregations, it's because they're not happy with something about the church, its beliefs or its leaders, and leave for another. 
But in most cases, that's not true at all. But think about that. Most of our churches experiencing this decline, what do they say? We need to ramp up our children's program. We need to ramp up our uh, digital ministry. We need to ramp up uh, the ways that we're connecting in the, in the, in the community through social media uh, so that people can see our church and see what we're doing. But the statistics are showing that that's not all that helpful. The church is still declining, meaning they're not declining because people are saying, I don't get anything from that. You see, I think the reason we so easily believe that this is what's happening is that people are just leaving one and going to the other. Is that when someone leaves, that it, it makes a point of telling us why, where they're going. Instead, it, it hurts, and we remember it. We remember when someone tells us why they left us, right? But most, the, the, the majority of people that are leaving are not telling us why. You see, when most people leave our churches, they're not going somewhere else. They're just leaving. They're just stopping going to church altogether. And the question is, why? And the why that they are giving is this. I see no connection between the hour I spend on Sunday and the other 167 hours of my week. You see, people are leaving church, according to this article by David Lose, because there is no connection, no bridge, no defined line between what we do and what we do, what we do there and what we do here and what we do in the world. Or maybe a better way to say it is this. There's no connection between who we are here and who we show ourselves to be out there. In short, the generation of today views church as an irrelevance that does not deserve their time. Think about that. To think of what, what we do and who we are to be interpreted as being irrelevant. You see, I think this stems from several factors, but one of the top factors, and, I, and this is what I want to talk about today, one of the top factors I see that has helped to create this chasm between church life and our life stems from a failed understanding of our baptism. And what it means to live our baptisms out in everything that we do. You see, the reason what I want to focus on baptism here is because baptism is the central characteristic. It is the central mark of our identities in Christ. Friends, if we fail to grasp the understanding of our baptisms, we fail to grasp who we are and who God is. For the Gospels, baptism is the defining moment of Jesus' identity. Certainly, is Jesus the son of Mary? Yes. Is Jesus a carpenter who lived in the town of Nazareth for a while? Yes. Is Jesus a pretty cool dude that knows a lot of Scripture? Yes. Yet in baptism, right at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, we come to know the most important aspect of who Jesus is. We come to know and hear, this is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. Here we find that regardless of all of the other factors attributed to Jesus' identity, first and foremost, we are to know that Jesus is the Son of God. Friends, in our lives, we wear a lot of different hats, do we not? 
I mean, I just think about it in my, in my, in my own life. I, at, at one point, I, I wore the hat of a professor. And then I would take that hat off, and then I would wear the hat of a pastor. And then I would take that hat off, and I'd wear the hat of a husband. And then I would take that hat off, and I'd wear the hat of a father. And then I would take that off, and I'd be with my parents, and I'd wear the hat of being a son. Or I'd take my hat off, and I'd be with my sister, and I would be the brother. We all wear a lot of different hats. In, in our own lives, we may, we may have uh, the titles that, that we do, the, the things that we do for work. You know, are, are, do some of us have a lot of assets? Yes. Do some of us have uh, not a lot of assets? Yes. Are some of us in between? Yes. But here's the thing. No matter what role or hat we wear, you wear, what defines who we are, a proper orientation towards our baptism reminds us that first and foremost, before anything else, we are sons and daughters of God. You see, regardless of your situation that you find yourself in, regardless of your past relationships, regardless of your past successes or failures, regardless of your future scenarios, baptism is the gift given to us by God for all people of all ages, of all nations, of all races, as a sign and a sacrament of God's never-failing love toward you. Baptism is a marker that we are a part of the family of God. And this is really important to grasp a hold of, especially in a tradition like ours that baptizes infants. You see, for far too long, baptism has been misconstrued as being an outward sign of my faith. Right? I say yes to Jesus, I go in front of the church, and now I need to show the church that I am a believer. But the only way that infant baptism works is this. We say that baptism is not about us or our desire. Baptism is about what God has done to me. God has claimed me as God's son. God has claimed you as God's daughter. God has loved you. Regardless of anything you want to say about yourself or say about God, God has claimed you to be a part of God's family. What difference might it make if those who fail to see a connection between what we do during this one hour of Sunday and the other 167 hours a week, if everyone started with a basic baptismal affirmation that before anything else in the world defines who you are, you have already been defined by God as God's child. Do you think that would make a difference? That, that if before anybody looked at you and said anything about you, they already started with the basic affirmation. Charlene, you're a child of God. Tony, you're a child of God. What if that was the first thing? The first thing we came to see. You see, one way in which I think remembering this affirmation would help make the connection to the under, other 167 hours of our week is that we would learn to use the term of Father Lawrence Mick. We would learn to live wet. What are you talking about? I'm going to tell you. To live wet is to live in the baptismal waters throughout every day of your life. It's to realize that Sunday services are not segmented hours on a ticking clock that pass by and then we move on to something else. But the worship we have on Sunday or whatever the day of the week the faith community sets aside, the worship that we offer is an extension of our baptism every time we gather. Each and every week, you and I are plugged back into the depths of God's presence to show love to others. 
To live wet is to live into our first identity, which is not a professional choice or even a personal choice. It is a vocational direction. It is something that we have been called to. We are called to be children of God. To live wet is to also be reminded of the one who baptizes. You see, in Mark's gospel today, in Mark's gospel, it says that John the Baptist uh, baptizes Jesus. In, in John's gospel, John doesn't want to baptize Jesus because he believes that, um, that, that he's not worthy to do so. In Luke's gospel, Luke has John being arrested by Herod before Jesus is ever baptized. So the question is, who baptizes Jesus? Or to take it 2,000 years later, who baptizes us? The answer is simple. The Spirit. The descending dove. It is God who has initiated this good work within our lives. To live wet is to live a life covered by the Spirit that loved us before we loved Him. You see, right there in the waters, we join Christ. We join the early disciples and we join every person who has gone before in partaking in the Spirit of God. Not a portion of God, not a piece of God, not a resemblance of God, but in the waters of baptism, we experience the fullness of of God in our lives. We are instilled with the Spirit of God and we are sent as God's children in this world. Baptism. Baptism then is wholly the work of God so that we might have confidence that no matter how far short we fall, how much we fail. If we do nothing at all, nothing we do can remove the identity that God conveys to us as a gift. Our relationship with God, and I want you to get this, this one sentence. I'm going to say it twice. Our relationship with God is the one relationship in our lives that we can't screw up precisely because we're not the ones that established it. Our relationship with God is the one relationship in our lives that we cannot screw up because we are not the ones that established it. God establishes the relationship. That's why it's so important to understand when we baptize Tony today that it's not Tony that's doing this. It is God that is doing something with Tony, that God is claiming Tony. Because when our love fails, what? God's love remains steadfast. Just because we can't live up to our commitment does not mean God can't live up to God's. This is the one relationship in all of our lives. And the longer you live, the more you realize we screw up a lot of relationships. Amen? But this is the one. This is the one we don't screw up. Because God establishes it, not us. Certainly we can neglect this relationship all we want to. We can deny this relationship all we want to. We can run away from this relationship all we want to. We can ignore it all we want to. But we cannot destroy it. For God loves us too deeply and too completely to ever let us go. You see, in an age when relationships are so fragile and tattered, it may come to good news that to some of us that this primary relationship between us and God is able to remain solid and intact. That is to say, God loves you. And as we say around here, there's not a darn thing you can do about it. In fact, once we get to that point, once we get to the point where we can fully trust 
that our relationship with God can and will be okay? Do you know what that frees us to do? Go love others. When I no longer have to worry about this one central relationship because I know that that relationship is established by God. I no longer have to worry about, did I do the right thing? Did I say the right thing? Am I in trouble? Am I okay? We don't have to worry about that. God says, I love you. You are my child. You cannot, you will not do anything to ruin that. Now get out of here. Stop asking if I love you and go love someone else. That, that is what generates the body of Christ to grow. When we're stopping to be so self-centered in our own relationship with God, to be willing to let someone else in. Friends, to live wet is to be reminded daily of who we are and whose we are. And everything that we do. I offer this to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.